Hiya. Okay, there you go. You're the first to see the new, well, except for our Patreon people, uh, you are the first to see our new um, opening video. So that was a lot of fun. That's uh, something that Laurie and I have put together in the last couple of days. So uh, we're going to be doing more videos. There's a bunch of stuff coming up, but we just thought we'd put up a new introduction, a new opening. So uh, I hope uh, I hope people like that. It was fun to make. So uh, what do we got? We got a bunch of things on the docket for today. And uh, I'm just going to start off with where we usually do, and that is today's page. So today's page is the incremental hypothesis. And so the suggestion came from Tristan D. And it was, I have to read it, someone trying to get increasingly large objects onto the bus. So that is our... Uh, our subject for today's page and uh, you know there you go so if you missed it if you came in late and you missed the uh, the new introduction video please check it out we're really excited and happy about it okay uh, so I got a couple things uh, I'm gonna sh show a few different things today but uh, we'll see uh, we'll see what's going on uh, Didi says uh, Janet's not feeling well today yeah I, I, I try to say I uh, hope you feel better Janet so uh, but thanks for uh, for coming and joining us today, Didi and, and Frank and uh, anybody else that's with us. Um, today's page uh, was a fun one to draw. It was drawn with ballpoint pen and pencil crayon uh, on a gray toned paper. And uh, uh, I, yeah, I had a good time doing it. It was one of those pages where, you know, you just, you just go from thought to thought to thought. And so Incrementally large things could have meant anything. I went with feather, bowling ball, tuba, and broken case, piano, and then uh, nuclear missile. So, okay, uh, you know, incremental. We'll see how it goes. We'll see uh, how it goes for episode two. But the second thing I wanted to talk about, uh, well, I guess it's the third thing now, because we've got our new page, we've got our new opening video and uh, more videos coming up soon. Uh, but we've also got uh, a book haul that we did this week. So let's uh, let's switch the old camera and uh, I'll start showing you some of those. Um, there is a London Public Library sale on the weekend. And, uh, and so when Lori told me about it, we were very excited to go and uh, check it out. So we did, and uh, found all kinds of cool stuff. I did a little video that I put on YouTube. We're starting to do shorts now too. So uh, we're just trying to step up what, you know, what we're doing with, uh, with the, uh, the channel and uh, bring better quality for folks because we really appreciate people hanging around and having some fun with us. So, okay, so here's some of the books that I picked up. Uh, I'm gonna break them down by some categories because uh, categories are stories. Um, so I've got things um, in a couple of different ways. One is, I'll start with our first one, and that is history. I like books on history. This is an incredible book on the glorious legacy of Africa that is not just all about Egypt. It's more all about the Sudan and the Kush kingdom and things like that. And so this thing has tons and tons of reference images and and you know um, ideas that I have not seen before, and uh, just such compelling stuff, you know. So this is going to be fantastic for me if I want to do a story set early in the past. So that'll be one fun, one fun idea. Uh, and then we've got. Uh, now I had a series of these. I picked up three of them, and somehow in the course of table to table, I lost one of them. And uh, but the, the the other one that I lost was Cowboys, so it's kind of covered in the Gunfighters. Gunfighters and Pioneers is about the early exploration and settling of the American West. Beautiful, beautiful packaging on these suckers, and uh, so you know. So there we go. So this this has got all kinds of again stuff on 
on cowboys and and gunfighters and and uh, shootists in the early early foundation of America, but uh, as well as the settling of pioneers in America. Now, um, just uh, just to keep on that positive uh, historical beat, uh, what I miss? What I miss? Oh well, I showed the video. The new opening is up. Hey, how you doing, Malcolm? How you doing, Jim? Um, but you can go back and watch it at the start, or I'm going to show it halfway through today's thing. Okay, so I'll show it after we do the book haul. So this is a fantastically cool book on the early, the early uh, um, settling of the Canadas, Upper Canada, and which eventually becomes Ontario, and and across the prairies, and so on and so forth, and in the Maritimes. Yeah, you know, fantastically cool book, and uh, compiled by. Uh, what did it say? Compiled by E. Hall. It's a collection of historical photographs by officers of the Geological Survey of Canada. So that's a really cool one. And on that front of early history of Canada, this is a fantastic book on Pier 21, which is in Halifax, and the settling of immigrants into Canada and the processes and situations that they went through and the waves that they came in of the Dutch and the Jewish settlers and the, the Norwegians. And, the, you know, it's all kinds of really crazy stuff that uh, uh, people went through to get here. Now, a uh, couple more on the, the, the resource slash historical aspect. We've got uh, replay. I'll do it. I'll do it right after this. Um, so here's a cool book on pirates and the history they're in. All kinds of different little bits and bobs that you don't normally get to see on pirates. That's the great thing about these older books and all of these textual and visual sources together. Nowadays, I really think it's just the most basic flash, big image, lots of talking. But when it comes to these, they're just so full of tiny little bits of things. Love it. It's even got the Perry Reese map in it for some random reason. Uh, if you don't know what the Perry Reese map is, look it up. It'll blow your brain right up your ear. So this is a fantastically cool book on navies of World War II. But what I really like about it is uh, not just the mapping and the, about the conflicts and struggles, but it's it gives breakdowns on major battles and and breakdowns on the on the how guns are put together and how the boats are put together. So as a visual artist, you know, wanting to draw, you know, some sort of related situations. Look at this one photo right here. Hold on a second. Look at this one photo right here. This this top-down view from somebody higher up in a gantry or something, taking a picture of people bridging across two boats. Like where you know you're only going to see that on cool old books like this. And it's got uh, you know compartments of boats and oh you just snap. I'm actually going to use this for a sci-fi book I'm working on. And, uh, and that'll be you know exciting for me, but. I uh, got a Norman Rockwell book. Everybody's seen this guy before, I think. But the fun thing about, and this is why I got this, some all these books for two or three bucks each, is uh, people cut things out of these books. Uh, none of them really like the Norman Rockwell. However, you do get... Are you going to open up? Here we go. You do get fold-out pieces, like so, of his larger paintings. And that's cool. So I don't know why it's still up there. Early Canada. There we go. Um, I'll get my bunny hug. It's time to snuggle up with a good Canada video. There you go. A conspiracy map. Conspiracy chicken. Uh, is it how guns are put together or how roses are put together? <laughs> okay, so that's a great Rockwell book, but there are cutout images from some of the early Saturday morning post cartoons. Um, okay, so this is modern Orioles on roofs and facades. If you don't know what Orioles are, it's the, the top part of a roof. Anyhow. So, uh, again, another $3 book. But look at all of these images of these window decorations on the top of buildings. But more specifically, you get these fantastic absolute sources of buildings. And, you know, when you're illustrating cityscapes, they get boring real quick. So if you can implement ideas like this in there, oh, you're cooking with the gasolines. So 
also there's a lot of really compelling architecture here that uh you know much of it is probably being torn down and, and redone at this point in time especially with the, the temporaneousness of a lot of stuff built in the early early mid 20th century a lot of that stuff's not lasting they're taking down these things nobody likes brutalist architecture uh but uh this is another fantastic book now i don't know if the whole book was blue and the front and back are just faded or if it was always green and the blues faded but one of these colors isn't right anyhow so last couple of no i got a few more so then i got some of these there's a developer's handbook for the call of duty infinite warfare game and uh i don't play video games but i collect books about the art of video games because i'm uh different and uh but there's such a wealth of idea ideation that goes into the creation of a lot of these video games and so if you're a big fan of that sort of stuff take a look for these kinds of books but these are expensive books no doubt and i can't give you isbn to this or anything like that because it doesn't have its outer sleeve but super keen super cool actually i could probably look it up in publishing in dc but you're gonna pay 40 50 bucks for those and then this sucker is the art of the adventures of Tintin, which is a fantastically fun film if you haven't seen it crinkles and there's a tear on one page that's why this book is uh is able to be purchased but all of this process on green screening and facial mapping for capturing of, of actress faces and then transferring those into video um, design layouts structural layouts room layouts character uh, adaptation from uh, Hergé's uh, original art like here's Hergé art and here's the objects they tried to make for the film you know how fun is this to this right so yeah lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of good fun but uh, there's a couple things you find out here. Like originally, in order to do a previs for the show, for what they wanted to do with some of the characters, um, Peter Jackson, who made Lord of the Rings, did a video of himself playing the. Uh, I'll show you. There he is. Good old Haddock, right? Good old Haddock, right here. And there's a previs of of Peter Jackson acting out the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> you get to see it, so super cool, super fun. Uh, fun book haul. <laughs> um, Corbin, yeah, you hear Kerman in the background? Yeah, he's mad at me because the books are in the way. Come on, cleared them. Come on up, you grump. Um, we're working on the videos with Corbin. Corbin's going to do a little halftime show coming up, so uh, we haven't got it ready yet, but we will uh yeah book halls and u.s thrift books rock yeah we have thrift books the stores here too it's just uh the library sale one is just phenomenal because i mean that 60 dollar 1010 book i got for three bucks you know i can go wrong there um i like the 1010 movie i watched it with my kids and their mother when it came out yeah good fun how you doing Alyssa? how are you uh last three books uh anybody else i missed saying hi to hi the last three books I got are in, instructionals and figure sculpting and wax and plaster processes therein, tools therein, um, different applications and approaches to to fabricating materials. And uh, again, we're losing some of this stuff. We're losing how to do some of these things. So, anytime I can find something that holds on to technique that uh, we can still accomplish, why wouldn't we? So that's a fun one that I'm uh, enjoying. You know going through and reading. Now, Lori got a stack a stack of books as well, but she's gonna show you those herself. Uh, here is uh, Alphabets and Design for Wood Signs, and uh, not a very big book, but uh, uh, good deals. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, love thrift books, yeah, they're the best, that's the best. So this is just a bunch of things that you can carve out of wood for science or businesses, but what's really cool in here is not just the examples that they give you for maybe things that you wanna incorporate in the stories that you're telling visually you want to incorporate some of these elements in there but as well as that this thing and then there's oh color ones what you know somebody carved a hamburger out of wood you got to respect that so then it has this and this is fantastic fun look at all of those that can be turned into you ready for it stencils so 
some silhouettes. I'm going to talk about silhouettes today. And then there's this absolute treasure trove of text examples that you can use, not just for carving, but for incorporating in your work in general. And then more examples again. So, you know, great book. Another thing that people aren't doing as much anymore. And I said, oh, here's one because I got to redo the trim in the house. Thank you, baby, for ripping up the trim and the, uh, and the doors, scratching your claws. But that's just for me. <laughs> But again, it's something that we're losing uh, is enough uh, education for people to be generally educated. I can't stand uh, personally the idea for myself to only know how to do one thing. I tend to be one of those, I wouldn't necessarily say polymath, but I tend to be one of those guys who has proficiency in a bunch of things like building the, the second floor of our place. And so when it comes to learning things, I learn, I read books and then I, I apply them. So. Now this is the last one I've got from my pile, and this is literally just a tutorial on building and things that tricks and things that you can use for building uh, models, like site models for architecture, study models, you know, ground layouts and and you know architectural elements. And here's an amphitheater. Like just this is great stuff. And so again, another like it was originally two dollars and ninety nine cents, and I got it for one dollar and ninety nine cents. Ooh, that probably how many years ago was this published? Eighty eight. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so what do we got? It's uh, uh, I need to get back to arting. I get easily distracted, says frankly. Okay, all right. Thanks for coming out, buddy. Will we get an, if ever get an official Lori's Corner? Well, we got Lori's book reviews. So it's, it's going to be, uh, she's already done a few of those, and she's going to be doing a few more. So uh, we're just, it's really been a chance to sit down and do it and to have it nicely edited and things like that. And so we've got some stuff coming up, like a nice one for of Gary's books and one of Paul's. And, and uh, we're just trying to get a bunch of stuff done. And then, of course, her book haul, et cetera, and some of the books she's reading. Jim, do you have all messages clicked? Uh, the new Turaco Creative Cast will be, we'll have a baby's corner. Well, there you go. Hey, Didi, what's that? I don't even know if I have that done. I think I do. Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, the book haul part of things. So those of you that have stuck around, you lovely and uh, gracious people, I've got a quick piece of fun for you. Here is our new show opener. Now, I don't know how loud it is for you. It's loud for me, but maybe my computer is set too high. So I hope it doesn't blow your ears up. But here we go. You ready? Here's our new opener for uh, the stream. <laughs> This is how I draw now. This is it. This is what you get. So, good stuff. Come on up. I cleared your spot. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, Corbin is trying to pull you on. Say hi to everybody. That's good. Uh, that's, that's, but that's what you get. Okay. So, now that uh, Corbin's got his butt waving in the camera, we can get down to business. Uh, so, a couple things have come up. Uh, hiya. What am I missing? And hiya, I have to manually click it at each stream. Oh my gosh. Uh, hi, Chris. Missed you, at, uh, missed you at Heroes. Hey, I appreciate that. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, I will be, before I forget, I will be, for those in the London and on, uh, London, Ontario area, November 12th. I got to write some of these dates down. Uh, things coming up. Uh, November 12th, I will be doing a lecture on creativity in your daily life and how to do uh, storytelling at TAP, Center for Creativity in downtown London, from 2 to 4 in the afternoon, November 12th. Now, I'll be posting stuff about this. You're just getting to find out this way first. And um, and then November 20th, so far we've got set up that November 20th, uh, Chris uh, Kaluri will come and join us on the stream. And uh, I'll be setting up some more dates like that and having some fun with that. Uh, uh, what else? I'm working uh, on an idea about doing uh, some tutorials on a regular basis at a a local art shop, and uh, 
Yeah, so if you're in the London, Ontario region around November 12th, it's a Sunday, at 2 in the afternoon, I'll be doing a two-hour talk, and we'll be making a comic page live. So, uh, Yolanda's buffering. She'll be right back. Am I spinning in the chair? Very fun. Um, I'm spinning in the chair in one shot. I'm reading Intellectuals in Society by Thomas Howell, uh, upside down. And, uh, and the third one, I don't know what I'm doing in the third one. But then when it comes back, it's me actually getting down to work. So lots of fun. Lots of fun. Okay. Good morning, crime fighters. <laughs> Okay, so well, there you go. You saw the new, uh, you saw the new opening. I uh, hope it worked okay for everybody. Um, but that's that's our first fun video that we've got done, and we've got a few things in the work right now. So we'll be uh, we'll be posting some of these things more consistently. We've got uh, logos for stuff, and uh, and uh, we figured out uh, a lot of stuff in a short amount of time, like making the pictures move up and down, and and. Lori is really taken to it, so it's 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 fun, and then uh, having people in on a regular basis is uh, going to be fun, and uh, and I've got a bunch of events coming up, and there's going to be more, and I might be, I'm I'm going to be looking for, um, with the new book when a new book comes out, the new uh, physical book, not the digital books we put on we put on Patreon, but the new physical book comes out, I'll be going to a bunch of different places and doing the same thing. So this is a first uh, dip in the pool for, for the official way of how we're going to do it. Okay, what am I missing? Uh, I guess they're a great idea. Oh, hey, good. That's good to hear. Thank you. I didn't notice the book was upside down, probably because it was buffering. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you, at the start of the video, I, I show the video uh, there as well for today's stream. So, uh, but thank you so much, everybody, for all your support and all your encouragement. Now, that's... Uh, a few of our first things out of the way there. Now, Corbin, what's next? Hey, what's next? He doesn't care. He's busy looking over there. Um, so it came up today. Uh, uh, Didi thinks that I have an unorthodox drawing style. <laughs> just, just do, I do pretty. I pretty much do everything odd. Um, one of the things that I'm really, really pleased with and really appreciative of is when uh, we gave a copy of my work to uh, Jim Shooter, the former editor-in-chief of Marvel. The review he gave me that's going on the back of the new book was um, heterodox story, uh, heterodox visual storytelling. And so what that means is, uh, is um, orthodox means you follow the rules. Unorthodox means you don't follow the rules. Uh, heterodox means uh, you make new rules or you're, you're doing things completely differently. And that's kind of fun. And I really appreciate it. I really, really appreciate that. So much so we've had it on the poster and all the stuff around the, the release of the book. And, and uh, yeah, and the business cards. So uh, when it comes to a standard, and we're going to do a little walkthrough now. So when it comes to a standard comic book page... Excuse me, Corbin. Now I'm going to show you an example of one. Okay, so this is a standard portrait format. I'm going to change the size of the camera for a second. Uh, Foxes on DD Show were cool. Sounds like you have an exciting fall coming up. Thank you very much. Uh, trying to explain, yeah, trying to explain the way I work is, is difficult, at least for me, too. It's uh, But it's it's good that you put that forward for me, Didi, because I'm going to need to do that more often. So, uh, oh, and Devin, uh, Yolanda says congrats. Thanks very much. Okay, so I'm going to switch the camera uh, for a second here, and uh, I'm going to reduce down its size so that we can get uh, more picture going here. I don't know what's going on with my goofball camera. that do anything better? Maybe, maybe not. Well, we're here. So, um, maybe it's because of the size. Just give me a second, folks. I'll... Oh, guacamole. That's something anyways. Okay. 
This is a portrait approach to comic pages. Now, this is an 11 by 17 page, and so I'm going to move it up as I go. But 11 inches wide by 17 inches tall, okay? And so, it you know, you've got your grid, you've got your bleed edge, you've got um, a lot of these pages come with these preset grids at the top and sides for you to figure out how to break it down to thirds and quarters. Um, but a portrait format moves this way, down to this way, down to this way. I tend to work in a landscape format because I want to do something different. And so because of that, and I don't want to be just pigeonholed into that specific marketplace of Western comic, because I don't really do superhero stories. Um, I, you know, I've done a number of projects in this format, but I've switched to this format. Now, the thing that Didi was referring to is that I tend not to pencil everything out first. I tend to just get right into drawing. So with that in mind, you know, um, we're going to discuss that a little bit. Um, but this is just an example of portrait to landscape. So now I've got this big old sheets of paper that, uh, that uh, yeah, here's uh, another one of those sheets that has, you can see the, the bits of business at the top that I have. And, uh, but I turn these guys on their side. And the reason that I do so is so that, uh, so I have more, you know, more of an ability to tell, in my opinion, something new and different or to approach the page in whatever way I want with this larger sense of space and a horizontal, like a horizontal format, which makes you think of television or film. And, uh, I like that. I like that a lot. I like the availability of that. So, so this is the way that I work. Um, dance, or gym shooter. That's rare. That and Denny Nell are gold standard. Oh, well, that's very nice, you Dan. Thanks. Um, and then Jim says, "I love the opening." Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Thanks. Uh, I can show you us one more time today, and then I'll just be at the start of uh, each of the streams. So, the other thing that I do is I use all of these different color stocks and cards like these different construction papers and um, cardstock pages in different values. And the reason that I do so is to give myself more availability of differentiation. So this is the 11 by 17 format. And then this is the eight and a half by 11 format that you generally see me drawing on the stream and the reason for that is, uh, again, uh, simplicity in itself, because it, it's much easier to carry sheets of paper that are this big. It's much easier to fit them within the confines of the frame uh, for the cameras to be working on a table with you. And, uh, and I get more options and opportunities of surfaces to work on, because they don't really produce thick cardstock at that size. But they do produce it at this size in a great abundance of tones and thicknesses and i mean that's just that's just a gift you know to be able to have that so the other thing that i'll do is that i'll approach surfaces and whatever manipulative little thing i can do to them to, to shake it up so that's where you'll see me using the the brayer off or these are cards that i've you know, not just braired off on top of, but then I've adhered down to a surface, so I'll have to work on a page on that, you know, and then there's, of course, some of my unsuccessful jelly plating that, uh, that becomes a uh, basis for, for images. Have I got any more examples here? So that's, uh, that's the second part of the approach for me. Now, when it comes to actually drawing, and I'll just switch over to, uh, some way. I have not picked a topic for today. So this is a thick grade cardstock I'm using today. You know, it's it's got some density. I like it. And uh, it's uh, it's a fun texture to work on. I'll hold it up to you. You're not going to see anything because it's a hot press. Hot press means it's smooth. Cold press means it's bumpy. Hot press means that it's less likely to to absorb uh, 
liquids faster. Cold press will suck them up immediately. Cold press is where we get into watercolor paper. Uh, hot press is where you get into, you know, you start moving towards poster paper, right? A lot of comic stuff done on poster paper. Uh, any gel print you can use for something is a success. Oh, I appreciate that very much, Yolanda. Um, I primarily use my gel, uh, jelly print paper for backgrounds, for backgrounds to work on. And uh, that's where I get into, where'd you go? And that's where I get into stuff like, uh, I'll show you. Well, you've seen these folks, but um, there, like these are jelly print surfaces and they work out really well for, for doing as, as uh, foundations, all this fantastic triscolated value in here. And then I just add some elements to make trees in a background. And it just, because your mind fills in those blanks through the abstraction that we use to represent things, then we can, we can be sneaky that way. Um, but this is just different. Like here's another one. This one came together really great. The only thing that turned out on this jelly print was the top of this house right here and the rest of it. And I even had to fill in all of that and see with all the paint on it, pencil and, um, and pen on it. But uh, the rest of it's just me going at it. But, you know, you got to have fun, folks. So drawing. When it comes to drawing, um, I'm going to make some notes on the paper in the back, and then I'm going to do some stuff on the cardstock in the foreground for today's page, which I have not decided the topic of yet. I have not uh, drawn one out yet, okay? Uh, Yolanda says, I love it. Oh, fantastic. Okay. I am a firm proponent that you can draw anything using squares, triangles, and circles. Now, more appropriately... You can draw anything, and then when you 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 start thinking about it more, your brain will turn those squares into cubes, turn those triangles into pyramids, and turn these circles into spheres, and start figuring out how to to give them volume and depth, and and so on and so forth, and placing things in dimension lets you start to understand how shadows work. And so these little progressions that we make, and I know I'm fast tracking this, but there's a reason for that. Um, and uh, the more progression in our understanding that we make for these different things, the better it informs us for whatever else we're doing. Now, the next stage would, for, for this image here would be to cast shadows from this object onto that, from that object onto this. You know, we're already talking about our light source being a over there. So if you just break it back down though into square, triangle, and circle, which feels like the most rudimentary and basic drawing thing you're ever going to hear. And for some of you, it might feel a little bit unnecessary because you're you're you've drawn a little more than that you know what i mean so you, you don't you already understand this part but for those that don't you know here we go so when i think about anything and and this is now there are a lot of people that say that it's impossible for somebody to remember how to draw everything freeform and i agree and disagree at the same time, you can't, of course, nobody remembers everything. We're always limited to our experiences and our, and our, uh, our exposure to things, right? So somebody says, draw this to look exactly like that. You have no idea what they're talking about. You're in trouble. But there are prime examples of characters out there in the world and no longer with us in the world, like Kim Young gi uh, who had an absolute fundamental understanding of how things worked in dimensional space. And, and practice drawing enough and repetitively enough and routinely enough in his day-to-day -day life that he could build compositions sight unseen live in, in front of people. And he would start these compositions at one point over here and he would take them to one point over here and draw everything within, within the space. And because of his understanding of 
dimension in space, he could draw them to a vanishing perspective in the center and have these lines that move out throughout the composition and without having to put those down and he would sit down and he would figure out that here's where the table goes and here's where the legs are and here's the cast shadow from you know from from the legs but at the same time knowing that it's just radiating out from a certain point so you know but he would just draw things without the guidelines and do so quite adeptly so it, it is a possible thing to do and there are prime examples of guys to look up like kim so he passed away uh in the last two years unfortunately so that's kind of that's a big loss i think to the drawing community if you're unfamiliar with this work kim young gi that's it go look him up um, and, and there's other people that are from his school, like Karl Kop uh, Kopinski and, 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 and others like that. Um, a great number of uh, different Asian artists who uh, I'm not going to butcher their names to their disservice, but you'll, you'll start to see a lot of them interrelated with one another and referenced by each other. So once you start looking at Kim's work, and that they just opened a Kim young Museum, so that's, that's exciting. Anyhow, so because he practiced this stuff in his head, and he's drawn enough in the course of his life, um, your brain automatically develops a catalog. It just does. Once you do something enough of the time, then you become far more adept at it. So, th but there are things that we all do. Like for me, Karl Kopinski does this thing where he'll draw these, these lines like this, and structure out the character. And then he comes in with another pen and he starts pulling out the helmet and the, you know, the visor and the, the, the big earmuffs. And he starts drawing, pulling in those fine lines for the person's face, but he does it from this rough scribble that he puts down first in pencil. That works for him because in his head, he's put down this abstraction of what he knows to be the form. Um, you know, there are a great deal of people that find it beneficial to to look at things as structure and what, you know, and you, there's a whole bunch of math, math, mathematical approaches that we can take to the division of a face. If you divide a face on its central axis here, okay, that would be the top of the brow ridge, or I'm sorry, the bottom of the brow ridge, the top of the, the eye socket, so that here's your eyes. Now, try to routinely space the eyes across the face like so, and you'll have equal spacing of the face. So five eyes across the face into the side of the ear. There's your ear, side of the eye. And it moves down to here, which is coincidentally the side of your nose. And your nose moves up into the central part of your eyes so that your nose is basically like that shape. And then that central pillar in the center of the nose is that part of the nose. And then the center of your eyes follows down to the side of your mouth there's a 45 degree angle from the sides of your nose that moves down to the side of your mouth for the black there. And you got the divot right here above your, above your thing. But from halfway from here to the bottom of your face is this little part underneath your lip. So now we know all these parts of the face. We know that the side of the eyes where the side of your, your face is here. So there we start to structure together our face and now we're putting everything together like so. And then the inside's the inside of the eye for your chin. And you know, there's there's the, the forebrow, halfway between here and here is your hairline for most people, not for this guy. And you know, halfway between here and here is the side of your hairline. So there's all these rules that are put into place with all of these different drawing tutorials in schools and you can sit here and you can make this regimentalized approach to drawing and having this uniform style for drawing superheroes or for drawing you know uh, you know characters talking like picture talkies like there's a fantastic uh, book that I really really enjoyed um, Agent X9 by Al Williamson it's a it's a uh, Sunday periodical from the 1950s about a, a super spy. And there's also Modesty Blaze. And there's so many good works over the course of history where you can have 
very little physical drama, but and a lot of engagement, much like a soap opera or a, a television drama. But you really have to have an understanding of how people's heads work and how, how shapes in space work. But at the beginning of this face, I drew a circle. And then I started drawing squares everywhere. You can break all this down into square shapes when you look at it. You can break down into triangular shapes when you look at it. And so when and there's a triangular shape right here in the eye, you know, when people start looking at form just as form and not as if this is one way to do it when you're looking at it as line okay another way is to do it when you're looking at it as form when you have an understanding of underlying principles like this then it becomes more readily apparent to study something and to see it as form so i have a fun little project for anybody that might be watching today's stream i want you strangely enough to close your eyes okay trust me on this uh, hopefully you're in a place where you're able to do this okay close your eyes all right and i want you to imagine the room that you're in just think about it for a second okay now open your eyes up so you're looking around the room that you're in with fresh fresh peepers here and I want you to look for in this room, in this space around you, how things are built out of circles, squares, and triangles. Right? Uh, missing some stuff being said, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, Corbin's the artist. Chris plays the role of the cat. Yeah, I've got that one written down. That's uh, um, that's in the work. Ah. Uh, I haven't written it, but I'll add your name to that one. That's a fun idea. Uh, Kim, Kim Young, he had a photographic memory too. That is a bit of a cheat. Um, so it's, uh, I have an eidetic mind. So uh, eidetic memory. So that means that, you know, I am uh, incredibly visually oriented, but it doesn't mean I remember everything in a, in a sort of uh, postcopic sense where I remember the incidents is happening and everything specifically, but I can draw from memory every room I've been in. I, uh, if I close my eyes long enough, I can remember what a fire truck is and all the facets of a fire truck and start drawing it. Um, it's a different kind of thing. And it is a little bit sort of a extra leg up, I'm going to be honest. But let's go back to our project. Um, so uh, you're looking around the room. You can see how everything around you is built out of those three principal shapes. Yes? Tell Annabella. Yes, that's what it was called. Thank you very much, Yolanda. That's exactly the word I was looking for. Do not try this while driving. Thank you. Thank you so much, Didi. Hopefully nobody's driving right now. Um, are people seeing the math in the unconscious mind? I think so. Right? I think so. Um, because there's a movie called Stranger, Stranger Than Fiction, I think it is, with Will Ferrell and Emma Thompson. Um, and so it's about a character who is starting to believe that he's a character in a novella. Dustin Hoffman has a great uh, part in it. Um, it's uh, when he walks around through the streets, he sees everything in, as mathematical breakdowns and components. He sees the steps and the, and the routine patterning and the organization of those and the rhythmic falling of those. And you get to see them actually drawn on the screen in a graphic representation. And, and that's a lot of fun. But I think that we all have innate understandings of dimensionality and space around us. It's just how much we develop them. So when you look at, you know, a clock on the wall, okay, and you know that there's an inside, there's the external part of the clock, there's the internal part of the clock. And what I mean by the external is that if you've got a circular clock, it's usually got a nice little round shape to the face of it that frames it in quite nicely. You've got your center point and you've got your division of that clock into 12, right? 12 equal shapes. So we can already see the triangles here. We can already see the circle here. Okay. If it's got some fun little imagery on it or whatever it is, if you, like, let's say it's got, it looks like a stopwatch. Well, a stopwatch is there's a little circle. There's an oval, which is a squashed circle. I'm sorry, that's a square. I apologize. Another little square squashed oval 
you know, we've got another ring within a ring on the top. All of these little layering things starts to allow us to draw more sophisticated. Whoops, I'm sorry, I'm off my camera. All these little things allow us to draw more and more sophisticated things. The more and more that we're able to reduce them down to, to shapes. The camera that is taking a picture of me right now has this pattern to it. Now, I'm drawing shapes in today, which is what I don't normally do. And we'll get into that part in a minute. So when I start looking at the camera, what I'm doing, this is a circle. This is a circle, but I'm not drawing the whole circle. So what, I, what I'm doing is omitting those things. So I'm drawing the shapes of the object to build up the image at hand. And so, but having an understanding that the camera uh, that's taking a video of me has these circular shapes built within, you know, that are compressed inside of square shapes, it starts to allow me to think of this, how can I could draw this camera into, into space, see the little pediment that it sits on, that's a triangle right there with an oval shape to it. If we look at it top down, it looks like this, right? So as soon as we start thinking, here comes the square for the base of it, we know it has dimension and form. So we draw the other parts of the shape of it. Now here's the fun part. It bends around and connects to the back of the monitor like so. And we know that this line com continues here. And then there's a serration through here of all these little bits so that it bends nicely and you can contort it to the shape you want it so it can sit on whatever size monitor. So that's the shape of the camera that's taking a picture of me right now. You know, whatever the object is, the more that you sit down and think about it and look at it and study it, you should be able to draw it, right? Yolanda says, I have amphitasia, so I can't visually see things with my eyes closed, but in some way I can remember things in 3D. It doesn't help to close my eyes. Oh, I'm sorry, Yolanda. Um, do you try... Uh, holding things in your hand, and I don't mean the actual physical thing, do you try to hold things in your hand? Like, oftentimes, I know a friend who has an infantasia who can do this, and he looks at empty space, but he knows from moving, I'm sorry, I put my hands on the camera, he knows from moving his hands around and figuring out the shape of the object, he can remember how that works and how those parts move together. Now, he can't close his eyes and picture what it looks like, but in his head, he, use, he, he uses some of his different senses for the physical sensation of touch and the, you know, the, um, the sounds that he might remember. You know, the most powerful sense that we have is smell. And uh, smell makes all of our other senses, uh, all of our other senses associate things. Uh, but he, that's how he utilizes you know, his, uh, he takes a challenge and he tries to work at it in a different way. I don't know if that works for everybody. I actually have pretty good spatial perception somehow. I can do it in my head with or without my eyes closed. See, there you go. Um, Nikola Tesla wouldn't draw plans down for the things that he invented until he had them all worked out in his head. Uh, which is something that when you hear that, it sounds like, yeah, no way. Yes, why? Because in his mind, you know, he was building, like he sat down, like if, if, if you can think of a triangle and you can think of how, you know, you can make a screw out of that triangle and you're able to put that together in your mind, all you're doing with your hand and uh, your tools is transferring what you've got going on inside your head onto the paper. And so if you can develop that to some extent, then it lets you take that next leap. Now, when I'm drawing, because I close my eyes and I think of things and I try to think of what they look like, like if I, if I think of the front of a vehicle and I have to remember, now, is it, this is an exact replica of a 1967 Buick. That's not happening with me. I don't have that, I don't have photographic memory. 
but I can think about how, you know, the lights work and the shape of the lights work. But then, so what am I doing as I'm actually drawing it, though, is translating these shapes and picking and choosing the lines that I put down in order to represent the objects. And so all this is, is what I call, on a regular basis, you hear me say Carnegie Hall. And what I mean by Carnegie Hall is, it's practice. It's just routinization of drawing and trying to have retention of shapes and objects in your head. And if you can allow yourself to figure out some methodology, whether it's, it's, it's physical, whether it's uh, closing your eyes and, and imagining it in your head and trying to turn around one of those things or, you know, in your mind or, or just remembering while you're doing it, because this happens a lot with people. If you're drawing, if you're drawing the entrance to a bus, okay, like the page that I did today. Now, I know that when you get on a bus, there's your doorway that you step through. And there's there's probably a little tiny piece of metal trim around the door to seal away the in environment. But we got to remember that this door is a folding door that either folds in or it folds out. And it moves along a guideline at the top and the bottom of the door to fold against its side. So either that door is like this when you're getting into it, but more than likely that door is on the inside. Why? Because of weather and rain and snow. And the more it's on the outside, the more joints are exposed and they break down. So the designer would have put them on the inside. So it's just, it's thinking along these lines, but then you start to think about, well, a lot of these buses have treads right here on the bottom. And, you know, some of them have an extra little lip right there for you to step up onto. And the more you allow yourself to think like that, the more that you allow your, your, yourself to to try to break down, but the more that you actually allow yourself to try to break down that object in your head, and then just, you know, you're putting it down on paper as you're going. Now, different approaches. There are a great deal of people that like the sketchy breakdown to do it with pencil, to look at an object. Uh, you know, if you're gonna draw a horse, you're gonna have the shapes uh, uh, that break down the facial structure of a horse. A lot of people think horses are really hard to draw, but when we, but what they are is really sophisticated shapes. Horses of complex shapes to to how they're they're you know they've got their leg built up here so that it's not it's not just a circle at the at the joint. It has this sort of a rough shape to its shoulder as opposed to everybody you know you might think it's just a round shoulder but it doesn't it has these it has these two little these little divots inside there and it has a squaring off at, at the lower part of the leg where it moves down into and there's a dispensation here that it moves down into the joint that's what basically like a knee like a knee right um and so when you allow yourself to think of how can I put these drawings down and how can I just reduce things into shapes and how can I start to define my approach to, to drawing in that way, make a lot of mess, I think. Um, uh, Dan says his mechanic drawing for the AC motor and work with George Westinghouse is amazing. That's in reference to Tesla. Yeah, it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I hear some people can't even draw horses riding bicycles on a fourth dimensional test <laughs> rack. That was a suggestion from Jim for me to do. There's a one page, if you go back in the Instagram or, or Facebook, you'll see a one page uh, story I did about a horse uh, playing guitar while riding a bicycle on the edge of a fourth dimensional test rack. And I had to incorporate that drawing into a into a book and figure out how to make a horse draw play guitar was probably the more interesting part of it uh yeah so it's again it's taking whatever those suggestions are and just thinking of those things in the form of shape and uh, after enough trial and error and after enough time um you can either look at any specific 
object around you and start to break that down into shapes. Or you can look at resource images. When I do resource images on the stream here, and I use those for I'm pulling up, this is the guy playing, the guy carrying a tuba. So this is the size I use resource images as. And the reason that I use them so small, hey pal, you can't climb on the paper. The reason that I use them so small, Corbin's decided it's time for him to sit here. I'm going to get caught up in a wire. What are you doing? All right. So it's because I don't want to have to draw every prescribed line that I see. I want to see it as its form. So when I see the tuba, and then in the drawing that I did for today's page, I put the tuba in a case. And when I was drawing the case for the tuba, I was thinking about the fact that the tuba sits inside, okay, and it's got this. See how it starts like this in my head, and then it goes and it starts to move down, and then we get into all the complexity of it, which is now impossible to see. Thank you, Corbin. Corbin's the star of the show. We all know that. So, so then I start to thinking about all of these, these parts of it, and all the tubing that makes up a tuba. And how it all comes together and the, the wind passes through all of these channels in order to bring up the tone and so how do i put those things down there's the, the nozzle coming out which you blow into and then here's the larger pipe that bends around and goes back into this smaller one here anyhow so the more that i come to an understanding of what the actual shape of the tuba is in my head and only allow myself something that small to work from, so I have to see the shapes. So then when I gotta do the case, and I'm thinking about what the shape of the case looks like, and how it holds the tuba inside, and whatever other ephemera, like the extra mouthpiece sits over here. And I remember this because I played baritone horn when I was in school, and there's a void in the case right there, so that you could put your mouthpiece here and put some business here for cleaning out the brass instrument. Now, the side of the case would then, because I'm thinking about how it looks, the side of the case would, again, follow the size of the thing inside of it. Oftentimes, these cases will have flat bottoms, so you can just sit the case like so. But there is, right here, a seam along the side that has clasps, clasps on it for you to lock your tuba in tight. And so I try to think about that as I'm drawing the case and now you'd see that from the angle I drew that. But allowing your mind to go, allowing your, your thoughts to wander, or to wander, I'm so sorry, and to play with these shapes should enable you to figure out how to break down some recognizable amount of drawing a thing. My interest isn't to draw everything perfectly. My interest, uh, oh, thanks, Jim. That's very nice of you. <laughs> Horse playing eruption, I get even him. <laughs> the essence of tuba. <laughs> um, did I say that? <laughs> I hope I didn't. Um, you should be able to figure out and to break down the drawing of anything. Just get settled. Yeah, get as far into the page as you can. Um, if if you enable yourself to do so. And then over time, you know, as you're working and you've got this source image here, then ideally you look at the tuba and I see he's holding it, his fingers are breaking out in such a way as he's trying to spread his hand to to hold the object. And so I just start, and I'm not looking at the image right now. I'm just looking at the paper, and I'm thinking about how folds work in clothing, and then I'm drawing the object in his hand and thinking about how, you know, he's going to have a hard time holding it because it's, it's weighty and the clasp is broken on it. That's a rough looking thumb. 
you know, but what I'm trying to do is get down for my storytelling the heart of the matter, and that is the image of the tuba case. And I haven't actually, I actually drew in my head the broken handle, but realized that from the point I drew the panel at, that it was going to cut off right there. Oops, sorry, I'll move that down. That it was going to cut off because of this line here. You weren't actually going to see the handle. And I realized that too late as I'm drawing it. Whoops, I moved it over too far. So, so then I have his eyes looking over here. And if you look at today's page, we know his nose is there. We know his forehead is receding into the background. And his comb over here is right here. But this is this part of the experiment that he's trying. So it's just a case of allowing yourself to see these things. You looked at this. And you understand the basics of shapes and you understand how these shapes go together and you look at your thing and then you sit down and you translate that from your studying of it in the way that you want it to be utilized in your storytelling and your storytelling and whatever your drawing style is. And this is something really important that Didi said today. Everybody draws differently, right? And everybody makes marks in different ways and interprets things in different ways. That everybody has different styles, right? But at the end of the day, the better you're going to get over time is from a better understanding of how things work and how things are built by shapes. So that's the three shapes. Um, so allowing yourself that and just scribbling and doodling. And well, people are hard, so break, break people down in the shapes please stand in the way anyways so if you break people down in the shapes we know that the head can be interpreted like this or we can look at the head as a sort of construction of oh circle circle square okay just for our rough breakdown sense neck is uh your neck actually starts right here and right here on the on a person's head that's where your neck is, unless you got a thick neck, but the standard neck follows right there. Right that little chin and that little that little chin line, a little break on the angle in your face. So uh, and then there's here's the math for that Dan had brought up. If you look at the body and realize that it's an absolute geometric wonder, the point, uh, there are points in your face that there's a 45 degree axis from your shoulders to your center clavicle, right? Or your, uh, you know, there's the center of your clavicle right there. And that's a 45 that runs up here and cuts to the plate of where your shoulder starts and so forth. And so that you can draw the sides of your arms and that's where your shoulder begins right there and right there. But you also can take that same point and run it up to the center of your chin and there's so much math in the human form. It's absolutely ridiculous. But I don't want you to rest on trying to figure everything out in that complex geometric form. Right? So you can look at it this way. And if you're more sophisticated in your drawing, that's going to work grand. But if you look at the human body as just a bunch of shapes like so. Circle, circle. Rectangle, rectangle. Circle, circle rectangle, circle, triangle. If you look at any one of these little wooden drawing dummies that you see in a store, guess what they are? They're this. That's all they are because it's the easiest way to look at the human form. Uh, essence of tuba. I don't know if you said it, but essence of tuba is definitely implied. Jim is a great example of style. I could recognize his characters anywhere. Yeah, but Jim is uh, one of those prime examples of, of good development of style. Not just, oh, this is my style of drawing. It's, I've developed a style through, uh, you know, the, the, I developed a more sophisticated and identifiable style from lots and lots of drawing. Um, there are people that will draw these haphazard faces where 
where everybody's like this and the eyes aren't right and the, the nose is always pointing out sideways because that's how it's easy but you're not really ever sure of where somebody's looking and you know it'll be like his hair is different in every picture and the ear is maybe it's down here today whatever it is but that's not because of style that's because of they're they're making do with their their lack of understanding the, the the fact that they haven't learned enough about the structure of how shapes work together in space and how those shapes might build up a face or build up a whatever and they call it style you know and there's the neck over here right and his body's like a big bandy thing no they're going to develop a style over enough time from drawing this way you know because all of their pictures are going to look the same but they're not going to have it make any sense unless they you know <coughs> develop it a little more work at it a little more are you seeing this right now can you this is how he helps me every day just for those of you that uh, were wondering corbin does all the work He's, he oversees everything that gets done if it doesn't mean his approval it's going to bend that paper i'm just saying uh Didi says absolutely thank you Didi. oh wonderful yeah so jim has developed an absolutely fantastic sophisticated style of art and he has an affinity to look at faces and to look at personalities and to emulate those in the characters not just not just you know doing a recognizable likeness of a face but it's how they stand and if you watch his animations and i highly recommend that you do it's how they move there is differences of how he has people move. Whether he's conscious of it or not, doesn't matter. He's developed this fantastic style over time. He's he's made the effort and it's proved out. So even in the development of your own style and your own expression of how you draw and the way that you feel lines and the way that you feel shapes in space, and whether it's you know very abstract or, or very routinized or or look at his head, you can't see it, Corbin's head's moving up and down. Anyways. Or you get really, really into this identifiable sequential media method or a fine art design of how the shape works method of, of the mechanical, mathematical look at a structure. You're going to find your voice. It's just automatic. There's two reasons for that. One, what we've talked about so far. The repetition, the, the fundamental understanding underneath the, the rules and principles of of shape and form and volume and space. All of these little elements and principles of design. But two, there's one face in this world that you know better than any other. It's your own. And so no matter, you're going, is that about enough of this? Here we go. And if, no matter how many faces you draw and no matter how many portraits and fantastic likenesses of others you do, um, there is an underlying stylistic approach to that to that structure of face that you're drawing that has some bearing or reminiscence in how your own face works best example of that that you can find out there is rembrandt rembrandt van rijn dutch painter did numerous numerous studies of himself and uh, but when he does paintings like the night watch and everybody has that same upturned mustache everybody has the same kind of you know curly hair and and uh everyone has a really reminiscent look and similar clothing but the structure of their face because of his comprehension of his own face and how the face works he can't help even though he's doing really good likenesses of all these different people having a little bit of his own face in there Indeed, he says, your characters are amazing with such personality, Jim. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, what a sweetie. Oh, Corbin, yeah. Hey, bud, you're a sweetie. Oh, he's left. We've got enough for me. Jim says, I'm not sure how I feel about artists drawing in a uniform anime or manga style. It looks great, but I like individuality more. And indeed, he says, you definitely have individuality, Jim. Um, yeah, I'm a firm proponent of singing with your own voice. Or whatever your song is uh there is highly highly set rules in manga and with with this application to manga 
and there are not as firmly set rules in drawing Western, you know, sequential or superhero. Okay, let's just, well, I'll write down super, okay, instead of sequential, because sequential is very broad. Western superheroes. Now, there are set structural rules of how people should look, but I got a fun example for you. Um, here are four of exam four examples and a fifth for fun. Okay. This is Akira. Okay. So Akira is you know, the film that everybody knows, there's an absolute standardized approach to how all the characters are drawn. You know, there's a standard the shapes for the face. And, and, and at the same time, despite that, Tetsuo is drawn with a more pronounced head. There, there's skinny people and heavier people. and But there still is an underlying sort of, here's how lines work. So there's a sort of, high point, fine example of manga that a lot of other mangas are entirely based on that drawing style. That's one. And uh, here's uh, another more contemporary book that I really enjoy by Yuka Sakai, I think it is. Yuki Sakai, I'm sorry. Kago. Uh, Yuki Sakai is a character. It's Shintaro Kago is the artist. I'm so sorry. Anyways, you can see uniformity in the expressions and, and the faces and and how he goes about drawing, you can see all of that's there. Here we go again, right? Two things, one's cultural aesthetic, it's Asian people drawing Asian faces with marks, but two, it's also uniformity of drawing because that's the definitive style like the hard set rules. Uh, here is uh, Jiro uh, Tanaguchi, again, similar style, but this book is co-drawn with Mobius, Gerard Mobius, a French artist. And so there's some influence and affectation by Gerard Mobius. But Gerard Mobius is also influenced by Asian books. So, but if you know his Gerard Mobius's work, you can know the differences. But here's some fun in the sun. This is, okay, Tayo Matsumoto. Tayo Matsumoto doesn't draw like your standard manga guy. He just doesn't. There is some of the similarities in mouth shapes and eye shapes again cultural but the form the marks that he makes the free form of the line the pen work he's not drawing from underlying structure he's following the shapes of faces and, and he's more inside of his head and yet he has an absolute ability for complexity in his drawings i mean look at here's the city streets there's lots of complexity in that you know you, you gotta love the difference of this though. But here, you know, here's another artist, same place. So here's my problem with North American manga can be very, very boring. It can be. But then there's pieces like this. This is Clark. Yeah, Wook Jin Clark is working over here in the North American market. And he's got all these sort of rules to it, but his line is far more expressive and far less encumbered by the hard set rules of manga. And so he has got all this wonderful flourish and stuff in there. There's also um, guys in North America that you can look at, like Paul Pope, what he does with lines. It has a lot to do with the tools you use and how you utilize brushwork and how do you utilize the pens? How do you utilize Zipatone? Look at that face, you never see that in a, you know, Akira descended book. Fun, you know, so you can still take a uniform tradition and make it your own. You can still say it and take hard set rules and, and, and bend them. I'm all about bending rules. So when I'm drawing a face and the reason that I start with a piece of a face and I move the pen around is that because I have an understanding, like, look, if I have an understanding that if this is the bottom of the nose and it has this cast shadow in it and then it moves up along here and then there'll be a little bit 
regimen there. Now I know from routinely drawing a face that the structure of that face is going to be very similar to how the structure of other faces work. You know, if you look at enough of my 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 drawings, despite the fact that I use as many different mediums as I do, and try to shake it up all the time by by choosing to work mixed media or to work in pencil crayons today, pencils tomorrow, you know, whatever, the next day. <coughs> um, you, that's still me. That it's still me that's uh, doing the mark making, and it has everything to do with this stuff that I've told you at the beginning of our talk, and if, that we've worked through into more and more complex levels. So that at this point in time, I'm just thinking about the the marks. I know, you know, if we've got uh, our upper eyelid and it moves like so. And that the eye, the eyelashes come from underneath your eyelid, right? Um, a lot of people will draw the eye like it's like this. No, they come from underneath. You know, and it's thinking about stuff that enables us to take shorter steps. And I think if I describe, if I have to use some a simplified term for how is it that I draw at in this regard as opposed to working it up from this regard and I think it's because I am doing that I'm just not putting down all of the steps I'm taking shorter steps but in my head here's your nose right here's your here's your parts of your face here's how it works right you know here's the the rest of the shape of your eye here's how your eyebrow sits on top you know here we are defining everything as shapes like that it's all built in there it's just i'm not working that part out is that i hope that makes sense for folks i, I don't want to say it in some sort of way that makes me sound like a pretentious goofball all I'm saying is that if you draw thing, stuff enough, you start to be able to do that. And now, somebody has been drawing for 50 years, 60, 70 years, and still, I still can't draw people. Okay, that's fine, but you haven't, have they spent 70 years drawing people? Probably not. And if they do incorporate people and things, it's still there still might be a disconnect between what it is that you're drawing and them understanding what they're drawing. And they haven't invested uh, their allowance of time into understanding what you're drawing. Uh, I'm going to use Didi for an example for a minute, and I hope you don't mind Didi. When Didi draws a bunny, okay, or when she draws one of the animals that she's drawing, even if there's a picture of the little bunny right here on the paper, it's got the big old floppy ears, right? It's got you know, when we're thinking about how does a bunny's face work, and there's a little button nose, and there's this little down to your mouth, little chin, and you start thinking about all these parts as you're drawing your bunny. The truth is, is that Dee Dee's lovely drawings of animals that she does is because this, these shapes that I just threw down quickly, she already knows them. She's drawn them. She's drawn enough portraits of people, and she's drawn enough images of animals despite the fact she's a fantastic collagist and the fact that she can and put together these images that are made up of, of pre, pre-assembled images and she can fill in the differences between it. She's got this much of a, a body of, of water and she can paint, you know, the entirety of this space behind these different objects that she's got in the foreground so that it looks like the same uniform water that goes across because she's done it once. She has a sophisticated level of artistry because, you know, she's she's worked at it, right? Sorry, Didi. I hope you don't mind. So, shapes. <laughs> you know, uh, I didn't, I couldn't understand how to simplify until I started just drawing over and over. It's still a struggle for me. It's still a struggle for me. 
right? It's a struggle for all of us. But, you know, and some people sit down and they'll sit there and they'll draw this cube and they'll look at the book with the picture of the cube and they'll look at the cast shadow of the cube from this light source over here, okay? And how it hits the, the, the cube and makes the shadow. Oh, but there's a secondary shadow that we now realize is over here. And because it hits that there, oh, you know. And so the more you get into these sort of things and these, these, these complex notions and understandings of how shape works in space, yeah, your work's going to get, there's going to be a more and more development of sophistication. I feel like I still have a challenge drawing a great deal of things. I, everything I'm drawing is a new challenge. I like that, right? I, I like that and I encourage, and encourage that. You're gonna put the work in to get your fundamentals. That's where that's where I'm still am. That's where I still am. So, you know, I think the mistake is that some people make is that, well, I'm this person. Well, I have the ability to draw this. And I'm proud of them for that. But they're not done yet because they're still picking up a pencil. So as much as you're a master, well, you know, have you ever drawn a toothbrush? No. Draw a toothbrush. Oh, how's it? And they got to think about drawing a toothbrush. Now they've drawn a new thing. They've mastered a toothbrush. It doesn't matter who we are or what level of drawing people, uh, people are at. There's still new things they're trying to figure out. There's a uh, drawing teacher at the University of Toronto. I can't remember his name, and I'm sorry for that. Who kept going to the same park for 30 years and drawing the same view. I think it's a little bridge with some rocks around it. He kept drawing it over and over again in pencil. It's not like he changed tools in pen or pencil, whichever it was, again and again and again, trying to get that image down, trying to really work that out for him in a way that he feels like significantly enough in his mind represents the thing he's trying to draw. And that's the beautiful thing about that. He's considered a master um, a master at drawing to teach at U of T. And yet, there he is, still trying to figure that rock out, still trying to figure that little bridge out. That's awesome. I love that. That's a person who's still in a state of growth. We're all in a state of growth. There's no, you know. Uh, Yolanda says, I'm enjoying the journey. I'm really happy to hear that. I'm challenged in buildings, all that perspective. I do not enjoy drawing buildings. Uh, draw, I completely understand that. Drawing with pens helps me to get over myself. <laughs> DD. I can't erase, so I have to get over it and draw again. Um, here's a fun thing about pens. Pens gives you this, and pens gives you this, right? So you've got a lot of allowance in pens by... Here's your underlying shape of your bunny. There's their little ear. Here's the rough shape of your ear. And then you come in with your fancy pressure and you start to define some of those aspects a little more clearly. And, you know, if there's enough differentiation between the light lines that you use when you're roughing it in and the heavy lines that you use when you're finishing it, it gives you the same sort of interplay of roughing it lightly in pencil and then going over it with a marker or a pen or whatever it is. If you're, as soon as you start feeling comfy in your pens, pick up a marker. Pick up a, uh, even if it's a Sharpie, right? And then you're going to find, oh, there's a whole bunch of different rules with a Sharpie. A drying Sharpie gives me these marks. A brand new Sharpie gives me these solid black lines. How brand new it is gives me crisp, sharp black lines. How dead it is gives me next to nothing lines um, that, 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 you know, break up along the way. Whatever tool you're playing with, whatever tool you're exploring, dive in. Have fun. Make a mess. Come out at the end of it and have your partner look at you and go, we got to go to dinner. Go wash your hands. or are covered in ink. You know, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, uh, just draw, 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 and draw it again. Um, okay, there's two points on a page. This is, I know, this is stupid, 
but bear with me. <laughs> when you're looking at the city and people always go like this and they move up and try to do the vantage point of the city from their perspective. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I find that helping to figure out how to draw buildings is easier to draw them, to figure out how to draw them from this angle. Because as soon as you start looking at the city and just do it as you're not drawing a city, you're drawing lots of boxes that move back to your place, right? That move. Here's a circular form for the water tower that sits on the roof, right? And as soon as you stop looking at it as a city and start just looking at it as the geometric shapes that build up a city, here's your little roof access, here's the raised edge around the roof so that people don't go falling over the sides. You know, here's the little cast shadow on that side if the sun is over here, which is usually, you know, I'm just using the same example over there for the sun. You know, this part of the building is going to be in shadow. If you've got the windows spaced out equally on that side, they're going to be spaced out equally on that side. But if you're drawing like this, you can give yourself the choice to, to just draw the windows peeking through like light sources on a black background. You know, Judy says, ah, just let them fall over the sides. <laughs> but when you stop looking at a city as a city and just start looking at a city as just shapes, um, if you look at, uh, well, I'm going to use sequential you know, drawings again. Uh, if you look at comics from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and you watch the, the, the physical changes in environment, and you watch the physical changes in uh, how sophisticated cities start to get uh, over time. And it's because once we have a uh, comprehension of this and once there's been another enough examples of you know a city being defined by these interesting shapes that architects get up to, and we start to look at how everything falls back to our receding lines and we get this sort of approach to how we're drawing, it changes uh, our reticence to draw stuff. Just shapes. Just shapes. I hope that helps people. I, I do. I really hope that helps people out. I, uh, I don't... Uh, I think I have a long way to go. I think that... Uh, I have an affinity to be able to draw certain things better than others because I've drawn those things more. One of the things that I like about the one page story extravaganza idea is that somebody says, uh, I want you to do an adventure of penguins on the moon, which is the top suggestion on uh, the pile here of uh, from the con. Penguins, astronauts, penguin astronauts had adventured to Mars, but then they learned that Mars has poison in the air, so they quit and go home. There's five penguins. It's five. This will be the page that I'll do for tomorrow, and it's just the one that's the next one at the top of the stem. But, um, okay, one, uh, I don't remember if I've ever drawn penguins before. You know, so I'm going to learn to draw penguins. And then I have to figure out how to make them astronauts. What's the spaceship going to be? How do they get to Mars and back from Mars? So is it going to be a spaceship? They're going to walk through a magic door. The, there's poison. How do we find out? How do we exemplify it being... How do we example, I'm sorry, it being uh, poisonous air? Does a penguin take a helmet off? See, this is why I like doing this one-page story extravaganza thing, and I really appreciate immensely everybody with their suggestions and all of their support because uh, it challenges me to grow as a storyteller, as an illustrator, as a writer every day. And I'm very, very thankful for that. Everyone. Please stay involved. Please keep it up. Um, it's uh, We're having a good old time. Uh, Jim says, when you're drawing a cityscape, how aware of you the function or design of the items that build up Neeson? Is Neeson... Not nice. A scene. Thank you. Sorry. That's because predictive text. 
Um, <laughs> Jim has a really good friend named Nisa. Are you aware of the design of the items that build up a scene? For example, the water tower, the billboard, ledges, etc. Well, that's where you cue in to your memory. And that's where you cue in to those thoughts you have along the way. And you think about when I was on a rooftop, on a flat roof of a building, can I just run off the edge of it? Or was there a raised lip to keep me from, oh, just let them go off the sides. Thank you, Dee. Um, let me think about grading, right? There's, here's your standard fence, right? Anybody ever seen a fence that bows out, right? And you want to think about fence that bows out as maybe a little more elaborate design, right? Then you've got, you know, all that available, or you've got those fences that do this with the raised bits and the little bit of information like so. And as that fence sits there, and the next one has this omega form to it as well. Greek letter, folks. Right? And so I want to draw that perspective. You know, some sort of form to it. Whatever it is, step in, inside your mind. And, and then you remember, water tower. This is a square that's rounded at the sides. So I remember if I'm looking down on the square, it looks like this, right? But from the side, flat lines like a square. Yeah, you can put the square inside there if it helps. And then I think about the foundational basis. And then I think about how the structure is for the supports and how it will sit like so on the sides. And then there's the one at the back, ties them all together. So when you start thinking about things and allowing your, your yourself to step inside your head and put those marks down, and then eventually over time, you just short step it. See that? That's a fun thing about a marker. Every line's here, lighter lines back there. That's with any tool we use, right? So then you start thinking about the slide boards that make up the side of it. Or maybe it's just made out of tin. It's got the little bolts along the side of it. Whatever it is, go inside your head. You remember you've seen these things before. And if it has to make you think about it for a minute, or if it has to make you look up some pictures of New York City rooftops, whatever it is, more and more over time, you're going to sit down and start thinking about all the chimneys on roofs. You want to have more interesting illustrations. Don't make the chimneys the same height. You know, they're going to be differently located, and there's going to be a sensibility of how they're located on rooftops. You've got a sloped roof like this, like that triangular shape. Your chimney is going to sit with that triangular part down at the bottom even if the rest of it is parallel to the ground. So again, it just takes more and more time of uh, drawing for it to become more and more complicated looking. That's the basic, that's the basic gist of it. Um, this is why I tell people to trace bodies from magazines. That was a brilliant example. And if you didn't have an opportunity to see what the, uh, uh, Didi and I are referring to, please take a look at Didi's live stream that she did this morning. This is a fantastic thing where she takes a magazine picture of, you know, you've got your, your supermodel type and she's sitting here with her, her legs up and she's in repose and she's leaning back on her hand and she's got a fancy pillow here and all of this business. But what Didi's trying to tell you to do is put another sheet of paper over that you can see through Find those shapes, find the form, start to understand how the body works. That's a gift. That's an easy. You're going to have more interesting lines. The more fluid and free you get with how you put them down at the first while, it's going to, oh, oh, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know if you've got triangle feet, whatever. That's fine. That works too. It looks like an abstract by Gupta. Um, yeah, fantastic advice. Please try that out yourself if you're interested in drawing uh, the form and understanding the relationship with the shapes of the body in space. And if it helps you as well, when you're doing this, 
think about, and this is might be a little awkward for some, but brace yourself. Think about how the body is made up of these rounded shapes, square shapes, right? And how the body is built up of all those forms. Uh, what's next? I love that advice. Awesome point. I don't know what I said. Maybe the penguins are astral projection. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. We just go into our mind, and what am I going to make out of this story? And the beautiful thing about that is, and this is why I always suggest to everybody that, that tunes into the stream here, any of the suggestions that you see have been given or any of the three prompt words that Didi will pull out of a bag or anything like that, if you want to do that, you do a story too. I would love to see it. And I don't mean it like so I can, I don't want to, I want to criticize it. There's no criticism coming from me. I would love to see how you look at this idea. How would you do penguin astronauts trying to go to Mars and finding out the surface is full of poison, so they got to come home? There's five of them. You know, how would you, how would you do that? Uh, because it's not going to be the same. And that's where mine are going to astral project themselves within a circular seance, and they're going to arrive on the surface of Mars and realize, well, we can't breathe here. Let's go home. So much different than a spaceship and all the, the penguins saluting and off they go. You know, that's the beauty of it, is that uh, whatever one person does, and that can be the same as the next. And that's where style comes in, and that's where the sophistication of your understanding of story, or your understanding of ideas, or your allowance of your own imagination. I am an Am I an art teacher? No. I look forward to seeing the sketchy pages of background sometime, Christopher. <laughs> All right, I'll do a page on top of this. You know I will. I'm limited. Um, there are so many pieces of paper and that I have done this to over time. My sketchbook is equally terrifying. My sketchbooks are just the same. I think people have seen those. So um, My mind can be a very weird place. Tap into it, Yolanda. T anybody here, tap into, the, tap into your personal weirdness. Now, tap into the you, the secret you, your secret tea that nobody gets to see because you're, you know, oh, I want to draw like so-and-so. Sure. Draw so-and-so's work. I really like Norman Rockwell. Well, sit down with an open book of Norman Rockwell and some tracing paper, and like Dee Dee said, trace all the pictures of Norman Rockwell. And you'll see that he has this gawky neck and this soft chin on everybody as they're standing there with their little rounded noses and their, their big eyes and, and you know they've got their big ears why look at a picture of norman rockwell look at a photograph of norman rockwell and then look at how a lot of the faces that he puts in his pictures got a little bit of that action going on there even though he worked from live models a lot and look when that photographs taken of live models but uh you're gonna have you in your work it's gonna happen at some level no, I'm not a teacher, uh, Jenna. It's very nice of you to ask. I'm not a retired teacher or anything like that. Um, I, uh, I, this is, you know, some people, basically, if I don't write and draw things, I'm probably a little unbalanced, you know, in the sense that it's so integral to me. It's so much of a part of me to to want to tell stories visually and, 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 uh, and through literature that I just do it all the time. And uh, for years I've worked at a bookstore and for years I've gone and done little workshops and classes and schools and I've taught from grade three on up to uh, uh, post-university business, business college and things like that, you know. Um, I just, uh, I like to draw. I appreciate you asking. I hope that uh, there's some help. If there's ever any questions on any of the stuff that you have seen me work with or have you, you have seen me doing on any of the streams, please feel free to ask them. If you don't feel comfortable asking live in the stream or um, in the comments of any of my social uh, postings or any of that stuff, you're more than welcome to DM me. That's that's fine too. Um, but uh, yeah, if there's any way that I can help anybody on their journey, by all means, there's lots of people out there. 
um, yeah, Gini included, um, that are out there giving some fantastic tutorial advice and exampling advice on on how to do different things and how to use different tools and mediums. Where it starts to become you is where you take the things that you're shown and you utilize those from that weirdness, right? You tap in, you tap into that very weird place that Yolanda says she has. And and uh, we're all just gonna just agree with her, just to not disagree, we're just gonna agree. She says she's weird, so she's weird. You know, um, over time, you're going to do all the things you want to do. And you're going to do them in your own unique way. Um, how I use jelly plating is grossly different than how Yolanda is, is very proficient at it. And But what I do with it is, is has very different, it has different, very different results in, in what its execution ends up being. And it doesn't change the fact that I'm, you know, very respective are very respectful towards how good she is or how good Didi is with the collage, you know, or how good Jim is with animation. You know, everybody has these, and I'm just using these examples because they've already let me pick them, but um, whatever it is that your niche is and whatever it is that you're finding, even when you're sitting down, even when those people that sit down and just, I'm going to spend some time today coloring a pre-existing image made by someone else. And some people look at that in a negative light and say, well, you're just coloring. I hate people that say things like that to other people, by the way. That's so dismissive and it's so unfair. The truth of it is when you're coloring objects and you're trying to figure out how to give some form and some volume to a shape and how, trying to understand how light works on form and to capture this in your coloring you're learning you're learning right there in the process and the more that you do that the more sophisticated those colors are going to be that you put down on the surface and the, the dimension that you give to that image or if it's not the uh, dimension that you're adding to it but you're adding all kinds of intricate shapes and abstractions and 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 different patterns on surfaces those are real things. That's fantastic. I absolutely love and respect that when people do that. I, I can't stand when people dismiss what somebody else is doing as their creative endeavor. You know, as long as you're not hurting anybody else with whatever it is that you're doing, and you're not hurting yourself in the process, um, go do your thing, Wildcats. Uh, I have a great personality for teaching. Uh oh. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your thoughts and experiences. Hey, thank you, Ilana, for, for coming and hanging out and sharing, and also for sharing yours. Didi, you agree with me? Uh, Didi opened my mind at coloring collage mixed media. Thanks for all that you share with others, Didi. There we go. We all learn from each other. There we go. Yes, Corbin. I learned from Corbin. I know him. I'm sorry. Such a prima donna. Um, yeah, it's. Whatever uh, you're you're looking to do, this is okay. So I have to figure out how to do new side. So if I've got here's what I'm gonna lay out for you right now, okay? Penguin astronauts adventure tomorrow. So we've got here's our penguins, and I'll draw them as basic as possible for you. Here's the right stuff right there, okay? And the uh, penguins, they're off to to move off to Mars. So there's the badge from their shoulder that has a Martian logo on it. Ooh! Right? Um, and then we've got uh, the adventure to Mars. So we've got our, our rocket ship and we'll push that perspective. So here's our rocket ship traveling to Mars with its little engines on the back. Okay? And it's moving towards this little dot out in the great sea in front of it. All right, so then there's that shot, and then we've got uh, it landing. Now, I'm going to try to put some fun in the sun here by having, uh, I think, try to incorporate penguin-like shapes and elements in all of these real-life things. Here, but here they are landing. There's all the smoke coming up, because remember, 
that's what it looked like on the PBs. And, uh, and then here's our first penguin in the spacesuit as he's stepping out of the ship. Here's a little cockpit. Here he is stepping out. Quack, quack, right? And uh, I don't know, we can have one of them hold up a, a paw, testing the air. Yuck. Now yeah, I'll get back in the ship and go home. You know, that's fun. Why not? There's a the the penguin with his tongue sticking out. I'm just doing stupid shapes at this point. So here's our first penguin with his, his penguin spacesuit helmet. And then here's the ship coming home, and then uh, flip her down. Mars is a bust. There we are. So, I don't know. There's our page for tomorrow. <laughs> That's just how my brain puts together an idea. So, there are five penguins. <laughs> this one's so fun about these sort of suggestions. All of this, there were five penguins. That's I love that. Uh, what are we at? DDI is just sub. Thanks, Jay. I'm, uh, Yolanda, I'm already subbed. You're in for a treat. You'll be mesmerized. Oh, I'm following that. Look at all this following of each other. That's wonderful. All DDI does things. Clean up my sub list last night. If you're finding others that are better. Oh, that's fun. A wing, not a paw. Well, you know what I mean, Yolanda. Mars or bust. Love it. Uh, what do we got? Jen says, a penguin takes off his helmet and dies. They all start running back to the ship. <laughs> but then there would only be four penguins. <laughs> Corbin, you got anything to say? No? Corbin says he's good. <laughs> okay. Well, then didn't do an awful lot on today's one-page story. But I hope that what we talked about was of uh, some help for folks. Uh, this has been uh, uh, very enjoyable. Uh, for me as well, I think. And uh, okay, I promised it earlier. I'll show you one more time the opener for the show for those of you that are here. Unless you don't want to see it, I you know I don't have to show it. Um, but I can if you want. Oh my God, let's just do it. Here it is. Here's our new opening. I think what's going to be really tricky there is uh, drawing like this all the time. But, you know, we'll try. We'll do our best. Okay. All right. There you go. Uh, oh, that's very nice, everybody. I got the upside down book this time. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, Intellectuals in Society by Thomas Howell. Anyhow. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. It was really fun. Corbin, anything else? You want to tell anybody anything? No, he says that's enough talking for me. All right, that's it for us. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. I'll be back tomorrow at 2 o'clock. I'll be posting this tomorrow on uh, Instagram and YouTube and on our Patreon. When we put it up on the Patreon, it doesn't have those little ads and little jibber jabber in or the writing above and below. So, you know, if you want to see it there, you're welcome to sign up on our Patreon. And we put all kinds of extra beeps and whistles up there for all the crazy cats back home. Uh, we got a whole bunch of black and white images that load up for people to color. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. That's about it. We're off for now. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'll uh, look forward to seeing whatever anybody's doing. And to uh, if you want to share it with me or if anybody wouldn't want, wants to work from any of the uh, story suggestions or one-page ideas, I always put them at the top of the text underneath the um, the posting so you can see what the suggestion was if you want to try it too. Otherwise, thanks very much, and I'll see you tomorrow at 2 p.m. EST. Bye for now.